Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning as we gather together. Uh, today is a, the trifecta of Sundays. It is a Memorial Day weekend, and so happy Memorial Day to you. For any of you who are visiting with us this Sunday, visiting from out of town, visiting family for the weekend, we're glad uh, that you are with us. It is also Ascension Sunday, uh, the Sunday in the life of the church in which we remember Christ ascending uh, on high as he uh, left the disciples with the Great Commission. Uh, this Sunday is the Sunday in which we uh, remember that event. It is also the first of our new summer schedule uh, in which uh, Sunday school classes will begin at 9 a.m. and then uh, worship at 10 and then followed by Linger Longer, which is a time of fellowship, which will be outside today. Grateful for Jen Tan and the work that she's uh, doing to get that prepared. And so throughout the summer, we'll always begin our activities at 9 in the month of August. We modify slightly and we uh, skip Sunday school and we go right to the worship service at 9. Uh, but until then, until August, Sunday school begins at 9, but we always start at 9. So if you will be here at 9 a.m. on Sundays, you won't miss anything. It will be wonderful, and we are very glad that you are here. Would you take a moment to uh, stand to greet your brothers and sisters in Christ? Since it is a Beverly Heights together, there might be somebody you don't always see. Be sure to greet them and tell them you're glad to see them this morning. You could now make your way back to your seats. We are glad to have you with us. But now I would like to invite Amy Lucas to come and bring us our morning announcement. Good morning. As Nate said, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning um, and that you've gotten the memo on the time of the service and that you've made it here. Um, and as he said, we'll be following this schedule through the end of July and then we'll switch it a little bit in August. I want to remind you all that Vacation Bible School is coming up quickly. It's June 13th through 17th. Our, our registration for students is almost full, but we really would love for volunteers to help us that week. Even if you can only help a day or two of the week, we would be able to find a good place for you to help. And so we ask that you let us know if you're willing to help. You can let Lisa Tiger know, or you can go on to beverlyheights.org slash VBS, and there's a volunteer form there for you to use to sign up as well. Next Sunday, June 5th, is our graduate Sunday. We'll be celebrating our graduating um, seniors from high school and from college. Uh, if you have a graduate and have not yet sent the office information about your graduate, um, pictures of them and information about their future plans, please do so as soon as possible so that we can um, put that together for, uh, for next Sunday. All children ages birth through kindergarten are invited with their parents to come on Friday morning for a summer story time at 10.30. They'll be gathering out on the playground. It's um, a time for them to play and make a craft, and then stories are read to children in age-appropriate groups. There's no reservations required. Um, you're welcome to invite a friend. Um, all are welcome to come this Friday, June 5th. And then just a reminder that our new Christian education classes will start next week. Next week will actually be Move Up Sunday for our children. They will all um, progress to the next grade starting next Sunday. Uh, you'll get more information from that this week. Uh, you'll get more information about that this week. But then for our adults, we have two classes that will be starting next week. In the social room, Bob Thompson will be te teaching a class on First Peter. And in the lounge, uh, Pastor Devlin will be teaching a class called Beverly Heights 101. Uh, it's a refresher class on the basics of Christianity and an introduction to the ministry of Beverly Heights. And so if you're interested in learning more about who we are and uh, why we do what we do, we would love for you to come and join us for that class. If you're interested in being part of that class um, in the uh, means of acquiring membership to Beverly Heights and inquiring about information about how to become a member here. I invite you to let me know that so we can be prepared and have um, all our materials in place for you starting next week. Thank you.
I'd like to invite you to take your bulletins now and join with me in our invitation to worship. Remembering that this is Ascension Sunday, Christ is ascended. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have ascended on high. There you have sat down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And your ascension and enthronement are not insignificant realities for us to recall and to remember. You have ascended in order that you might send to us the Helper, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who will lead us and guide us into all truth. Your Holy Spirit, which is a counselor, gives us wisdom from on high. Your Holy Spirit, which leads us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We thank you for the Holy Spirit coming and soon to come on Pentecost as we remember the coming of the Spirit long ago. But you ascended in order that he might come. And you ascended in order that you might sit down sitting down and declaring for all the world to know that the work is finished. You are at rest. Because Christ has been crucified. Christ was buried. Christ rose. Christ ascended and is now seated. And we rejoice and celebrate in the finished and accomplished work of the Lord Jesus Christ this day. And we ask, Lord, that you would send to us your Holy Spirit that you would come and be a helper to us today as we seek and endeavor to worship you in spirit and in truth. Fill our hearts and our minds. Fill this space with your glory. May your glory descend upon us. And may you receive glory, Lord, as we enter into that glory in worship. Lord, may we also be changed in order that we might glorify you more and more, not only in this place, but as we are sovereignly scattered. And so we give ourselves to you this day, Lord, knowing that the work is finished, knowing that Christ is ascended. We come to you and worship. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number six, taken from the smaller hymn book known as the Hymns for Modern Reformation. I'd like to invite you to take that hymn book, turn with me to hymn number six. We will stand as we sing this great ascension and enthronement hymn. Round the throne in radiant glory.
If you would take your bulletin now and join with me in our responsive reading, taken from Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all people, shout to God with loud songs for joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our God, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The prince of peace is We continue now in our ascension worship this morning as we sing hymn number 289, a hymn of glory, let us sing an ascension hymn. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I invite you now to turn with me in your Bibles or take a pew Bible if you don't have one and turn to Revelation chapter 5 for this morning's New Testament reading. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look upon it. 
And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Revelation chapter 5 is depicting for us a scene of Christ's enthronement. And it is a scene of great glory. And upon the revelation of that glory, there is an appropriate response. That is, those who are in heaven who hear and see respond by falling down, bowing down. And as we hear the words of Revelation chapter 5 read, and as we have described to our minds and to our hearts this glorious enthronement scene, it is good and right for us to go to our knees as well. To go before the Lord in prayer and in confession. It is a scene of glory, holiness, power. And by it we read our own lives and we recognize that we are not consistent. We do not live a life consistent with that glory, with that holiness. Nevertheless, Revelation 5 tells us that Jesus shed his blood in order that we might participate in that same glory. And so I want to encourage you now to bow your heads and your hearts with me as we search our hearts and our minds, as we present before the Lord confessions of sin. Let us pray. Worthy are you, O Lord Jesus Christ. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might, honor and glory and blessing. To you, O Lord, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. For you have conquered sin. You have conquered death. You have conquered us. And you have conquered us not so that we might be put away, but 
so that we might be saved. You've conquered our enemies, the enemies without and the enemies within. And you invite us into your very presence in order that we might share in your glory and in your holiness, in order that we might celebrate the work that you have done, work that has caused us to be free. And so, Lord, I pray that you would hear our prayers this morning, that you would receive them, that you would incline your ear to us. And because Jesus Christ died and rose, that you would grant to us your peace, that you would communicate to us that our sins are forgiven, that they are forgiven indeed, and that we can enter into the fullness of all that you've called us to be and all that you've called us to do, that you've entered into, uh, you've called us into your very presence this day, this hour, in order that we might know you, in order that we might know your love and your mercy in order that we might receive grace. Minister that grace to our hearts today. and Help us to flourish. Nurture us, Lord, towards our perfection in order that you might be glorified, in order that we might be your people. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. <clears throat> Let us continue to sing a hymn of glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll stand as we sing verse 4. Please be seated. And as you are seated, I want to invite the ushers to come forward to wait upon you as we continue to offer our worship and our praise and our admiration of the Lord Jesus Christ through the giving of our tithes and offerings.
This morning we come to the end of our Eastertide series, our final installment as we consider what it means to walk an abundant life as we've been examining the Gospel of John and that theme of abundant life that Jesus uh, establishes in John chapter 10, I've come that you may have life and life more, more abundantly, life in the full. And throughout uh, this series, we've been considering what it is that Christ died for. He died in order that, and rose in order that we might uh, enjoy and walk in the abundant life. Next week will be uh, Student Ministry Sunday or Graduate Sunday. and uh, um, Peter Chase will have the opportunity to share some uh, reflections on the year and to uh, share with us a report about uh, the work that's being done in student ministries. After that, we will have uh, VBS Sunday, which is always a an enjoyable but slightly different uh, service than we typically have on Sunday that's uh, mindful of the children and also uh, gets us prepared for what is one of the most significant and important uh, outreach and uh, formational opportunities that we have for our children. Uh, This year we'll be looking at the armor of faith uh, taken from the book of Ephesians and I'll uh, begin um, that that exploration of the... um, of the uh, armor of God, uh, I said armor of faith, armor of God, and uh, we'll begin that next in two Sundays, and then they'll follow through throughout the week to look at all the parts and the pieces of the armor of God. But our text for this morning is found in John chapter 14. We'll be reading the entirety of the chapter, verses 1 through 31. If you are able, I'd like to invite you to uh, turn with me to that text in your Bibles or Pew Bible, and if you're able to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father." Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while the world will, not see, will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. 
Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives you do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and for your teaching. Jesus, your church has arisen. We rise in order that we might hear from you. And to go from this place, to go from this place of understanding to greater understanding, to go from this place of commitment to greater commitment, to go from this place of glory to greater glory. We cannot do this without you, without your word, without the preaching and application of your word among us. Help us, Lord, to rise and to walk in abundant life by grace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. What you see on the screen is a photograph taken in January of, or near January of 1994, at the Toronto Airport Vineyard Church. This is uh, photographic evidence, if you will, certainly a record of what has come to be known as the Toronto Blessing. Perhaps some of you have heard of the Toronto Blessing, which began early in 1994. The Toronto Blessing is now known and referred to as a Christian revival that uh, took place over the course of many years in Toronto at the Toronto Airport Vineyard Church. And the Toronto Blessing has become now synonymous within charismatic circles for a theology that includes greater works, as Jesus was talking about the greater works that will be done as a result of his ascension, greater works than these. And those within the charismatic church have Uh, read that text, our text for this morning, John chapter 4, and and have come to interpret and believe that the greater works tend to be expressed by charismatic renewal and ecstatic uh, evidence of uh, and signs of wonders of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ moving in the in the church and among people through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Toronto blessing was uh, characterized and known for an increased awareness of God's love, of religious ecstasy, external observances of ecstatic worship, things known as being slain in the spirit, uncontrollable laughter, emotional and or physical euphoria, crying, healing, healing from emotional wounds, healing of damaged relationships. There were accounts and reports of electric waves of the Spirit felt and perceived. Holy laughter was known to occur with regularity during the Toronto Blessing. Laughter as a result of a sense of overwhelming joy. It was a hallmark manifestation of the Toronto Blessing. And there were even reports and observations or uh, those who heard worshipers roaring like lions or making other animal noises. Leaders and worshipers present in these services claim that most of these manifestations, including people being uh, slain in the spirit or roaring like lions, were physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit's presence and power. So, Strong were and so frequent were these experiences, and so strong was the attraction that in December of 1994, at the end of that year, 
Toronto Life magazine declared the Toronto Airport Vineyard as Toronto's most notable tourist attraction of the year. And I know that that's true because my trip to the Toronto Airport Vineyard in the summer of 1994 was something that our family was attracted to and wanted to go. It was my first trip out of the country, but it was not my first trip to the wild, wild west, or what I sometimes refer to somewhat tongue-in-cheek as the circus. And I've often wondered what was so attractive about the Toronto Blessing. Why did people from all over the northern uh, United States and Canada travel to Toronto to experience and to observe these kinds of things? Well, there are a number of reasons I think that could be offered, but I want to suggest to you that the driver, it seems to me, was a desire for intimacy. The heart is made for intimacy. The human heart is made for longing to be with others and to be with the other. And because eternity is bound up in the heart of God and because, as Augustine said, we were made for you and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, we all long for intimacy. And this church and this tradition was doing everything that they could in order to find intimacy, to experience intimacy. I remember that that was a driver within the charismatic tradition that I was raised in. I saw all of these things. I heard all of these things. I heard the roaring lions. I heard the laughter. I saw people being slain in the spirit. And I saw so much more within my charismatic upbringing, speaking in tongues, prophetic words, exorcisms when I was just a teenager. I think what drives that is people want to know that God is real, to really know him, and to have an intimate and real connection to God. And so in the charismatic church, I saw many abuses, many things I would characterize today as sub-Christian or unchristian. I remember being in one charismatic worship service in which the health and wealth gospel was being interwoven into that uh, ministry and into that worship service. And the leader who was preaching literally cried out, Money, come to me now. Calling forth money. A lot of abuses. But despite all the weirdness, And despite all the bad theology, the one thing that I am indebted to the charismatic tradition for teaching me over all those years is this one seminal and incontrovertible truth that we can, as believers, have an intimate relationship with the triune God. And so what I want to summarize for you this morning, not only by way of anecdote and experience, but because this is what I believe Jesus is teaching us in John chapter 14, that Jesus is a real person and you can really know him. The thing that I will always be grateful to the charismatic church for is that they instilled in me a belief and a sense that Jesus really is a real person. Not an idea, not a character in the Bible, but a real person. And we can really know him. Jesus is telling us as much in our text for this morning. As people, Jesus knows that we long for intimacy And as Christians, we really should embrace and lean into that desire that is in us to have an intimate relationship with God because God wants to have that right intimate relationship with us. Intimacy with Jesus is a necessary part of the abundant life. What does it mean to walk in abundance? What does it mean to enjoy the abundant Christian life? Well, it is to know Christ intimately and with abundance. 
Jesus is a real person. And you can really know him. It, it pains me to know the little children can grow up in the church and never come to an understanding that the Jesus that we preach within the church, within the evangelical church, we preach to the kids, but they don't know that Jesus is a real person. And you can really know him. And you can be friends with him. And you can walk with him. And you can commune with him. And you can speak with him. And he has power and presence in your life. Jesus is a real person. And because Jesus is a real person and intimacy with Jesus is a part of the abundant Christian life, Jesus offers himself to us. And he offers himself to us in a multiplicity of ways. Not necessarily in ecstatic and extraordinary ways, but in ordinary and very specific ways. Jesus offers himself in what I want to describe to you in at least three ways. Jesus offers himself to us in intimacy through a personal relationship with him and through a growing knowledge of him and through experience. You have to have good experiences with Jesus. I want to look at each of these in their turn, if you will allow it. First is Jesus is a real person, and you can really know him personally through an abundant relationship with him. Jesus is a real person. But what does a person mean? When we say that Jesus is a person, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, what are we identifying? What are we highlighting? What are we affirming? Well, let me suggest something to you, and I want to use a little bit of technical language to get at it, but I want to try to define for you what personhood means. This is what it means to be a person. You are are a person. Each one of you sitting here in this worship service today, you are all persons. Why? Because you are conscious individuals. You have a consciousness. You are conscious individuals that feel pleasure and pain. You know it. You feel it. You have perceptions of yourselves as individuals. And you perceive other individuals around you. You can locate yourself in time and in space. You can locate yourself in the past, in the present, and in the future. As persons, you experience emotions. You can think conceptually. You can see a pulpit, and you can know it that way, but you can also conceive it in your mind. You have the capacity for language. You can speak. You can grasp values. You have desires. You exercise reason. You can formulate plans for the future. You make free choices. In short, a person is an individual with a rational self-conscience and a free agency. Now, that's a very technical definition, but I think it describes you. I think you all agree that you have all of those things. And guess what? So does Jesus. Even still, Jesus felt pleasure and pain. Jesus had a perception of himself and those around him. He could locate himself in time and in space, in the past, the present, and the future. Jesus experienced emotions. He could think conceptually. He was rational. He could speak languages. He could grasp values. He had desires. He could formulate plans for the future. He could make free choices. He is a person. And as a person, you can be in relationship to him and with him as a person. You're a person and he's a person. Jesus is a real person. And you can really know him. In many ways, not in all ways, but in many ways, Jesus is just like you. Do you want to know what Jesus is like, at least to a degree? Look in a mirror. He had a body. He had a life. 
He had desires, and he still does. He still has a body, and he still has a life, and he still has desires for you, and he wants to be in right relationship with you. Jesus is a person. God the Father is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person, and they enjoy relationship with one another, and they invite us into the abundant relationship that they enjoy because we were made for him. We were made to enter into intimacy, and he wants us to be with him. And God brings two important things into the relationship in order that we might have intimacy with him. First, he brings a mediator. Because you and I are sinners. And because of our sin, we're separated from God, and we know it. Because our hearts were made for him and were restless until they find rest in him. And there's nothing that we can do. There's no place that we can go. And there's no other relationship that we might seek to cultivate that will satisfy that desire for him. But we can't be with him because of sin. And so God sent forth his son the second person of the Trinity, his one and only son, in order that he might die and shed his blood, in order to satisfy justice and to eradicate sin from our life, in order that we might be in real intimate relationship with him. He brings to the relationship a mediator, and he also brings into that relationship his presence. You've all heard of the omnis, haven't you? What are some of the characteristics of God? God is omnipotent. We think that that's wonderful. All powerful. We get an understanding of what it means that God is all powerful. God is omniscient, which is to say that he's all knowing and that we would want God to be all knowing. That's consistent with what it means to be God. But God is also omnipresent. I've often wondered why does that matter? I don't see God everywhere. What does it mean that God is omnipresent? It's a central and necessary attribute of God because God wants to have a personal and right relationship with each one of us. And so he ministers his presence to each one of us. God is big enough to be in a personal relationship with each one of us. Jesus is a real person. And you can really know him. Jesus is a real person, and you can really know him intelligently through an abundance of knowledge. See, Jesus speaks about knowing him all throughout our text for this morning. In John 14, he refers to knowing him again and again and again, and knowing the Father. There are those, there are those who claim that they are in right relationship with Jesus Christ, but they remain ignorant of him. Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Sure do. What has he commanded of you? I'm not sure. What has he required of you? I'm not sure. What does it mean that he's the second person of the Trinity? I'm not sure. We cannot claim to be in right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and know nothing of him. That is shallow. That is inconsistent. We cannot claim a relationship with anybody if we don't know something about them. Relationship requires knowledge. I can't say that I'm in a relationship with my wife and have been for almost 25 years. And if you were to ask me, when's her birthday? I can't say, I don't know. Where did she grow up? I don't know. What are her hopes and dreams? I don't know. We can't claim to have a personal relationship with Jesus and not have a knowledge. Relationship requires knowledge. Knowledge of who God is. Knowledge of God's great acts. Knowledge of his purposes. Plumbing the depth of the knowledge of the love of God. And God reveals all of this to us in his word. We call this theology, dogmatics. 
not barking like a dog, roaring like a lion, but knowing something about who God is. And I want to suggest to you that theology is not bore and dull and tired. Theology is exciting. Theology is the thrilling drama of a relationship with the God of the universe who comes to us in Jesus Christ. Dorothy Sayers, a well-known English writer and poet, once said, the dogma, the theology, the dogma is the drama. The theology of God is the passionate, visceral, real contours of our relationship with the God of the universe. When Diane Feinstein said in her examination of Amy Coney Barrett as she was being examined for a lower appellate court, Diane Feinstein was concerned about Amy Coney Barrett and said, I'm concerned that the dogma lives loudly within you. To which we all say, amen. The dogma is the drama. The theology is our relationship with God, whereby we know him and can be in right relationship with him. Theology forms the relationship. God is the most exciting person you will ever meet. Hands down, far and away, the most exciting person you will ever have the opportunity to meet. And he says, get to know me. In order that you might have a relationship with me, an intimate relationship with me. Jesus is a real person. And we can know him through a personal relationship and as we grow in our knowledge of him and as we grow in abundant and good experiences. You have to have good experiences with Jesus. I'm not so sure that those experiences are found in holy laughter and roaring like lions. Concerned that there may be excesses to that. But we can't go into the other side of the road and into the ditch on the other side and expect that we don't have any experiences with Jesus. If you have not had a real and a visceral experience of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, I would ask whether or not you are in relationship with him. Do you know him? And have you experienced his presence and his power in your life? We are called to have good experiences with God if we're going to have intimacy, if we're going to walk in the abundant Christian life. And I want to define experience in a particular way. Practical contact. Practical contact. How do we have a practical contact with God? doesn't have to be the extraordinary, ordinary. Look out into the world. And what do you see? The heavens declare the glory of God. And as you see it, are you touched by the wonder and the majesty and the splendor of God? You can read everything you want to read about the Grand Canyon, but there's nothing like going and seeing it for yourself. Practical contact with the wonder and the power and the glory of God? Have you had practical contact with the providences of God? And you must be, we must grow in our sensitivity to our own experience to trace the providential lines of God's grace in our lives, to see upon reflection how he kept us from harm and danger, how he, how he caused us to wait. Not yet, not yet, Nate, not yet. Hold on. Why, Lord, why? Not yet. The time is coming, but it is not yet. Lord, now? Yes. And we enter into that moment, and we look back, and we see how the Lord had been preparing things for such a time as this, to see the providential hand of God in your life, practical contact in the world through providence, and in the church. God calls us into his presence each and every Sunday in order that we might experience God practically in this place. 
It is, the church is the normative, natural, and ordinary means of practical contact with Jesus each and every week. As the word of God is preached and proclaimed, as I preach God's word to you, it is my sincere desire and intent to embody the life of Christ through his word in order that you might hear and see the risen Lord Jesus Christ. To have contact with Jesus through his word. And not only through his word, but through his table. We come to worship and we enter into the real presence of Christ every time we come to this table. We enter into the real presence of Christ and have personal contact with it as you enter into the fellowship of the body of Christ. Look to your left. Go ahead. Look to your right. Look in front of you, behind you. What do you see? Jesus. Jesus. Practical contact and experience with Jesus. We need good experiences with Jesus. Regular, practical contact because we were made for him and we were made for intimacy. And if we don't regular, regularly receive that intimacy through practical contact, then our hearts will look for practically anything else to try to satisfy that need for intimacy. If we are not offering to you the Lord Jesus Christ in this place, and your heart is not satiated and satisfied by God, then I apologize. Because I know you will go and look somewhere else to find it. As I've been thinking about these things and how we were made for intimacy, and that's a part of walking in the abundant life, I've been convicted over our frequency of which we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Because it is God's means by which we have practical contact with him. And the early reformers, Luther and Calvin, they argued for weekly communion. There are a lot of theological reasons why that can be argued and theological reasons why we may argue against weekly communion. But I think this argument from intimacy is compelling. We were made for God. And he desires to be with us. And he gives us, he gives himself to us through the table. And if we withhold God's presence through the power and the grace of, of word and sacrament, then our young ones will tra- travel to Toronto. As I did as a high school kid. Longing for intimacy. Intimacy. Jesus is a real person, and you can really know him. And you can know him because to kind of turn the tables on you, I want to share with you that we really are a charismatic people here at Beverly Heights Church. Because the word charismatic comes from the word charisma. And charisma comes from the word charis, which means grace. And Jesus Christ has graciously offered himself to us each and every week as we hear his word preached and as we come to his table in order that we might receive him by grace and the power of the Holy Spirit and have practical and real contact. It's spiritual. It doesn't mean it's not practical. It is spiritual contact with him and have our hearts fed. And so, friends, I would remind you that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat of it. This is my body here at the table. I am present. Come to me and find intimacy. Have your spirit in contact with the spirit of Christ. In like manner, he also took the cup of the new covenant, 
pouring it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant established in my blood. Take and drink of it. Drink it and be satisfied with my presence. Drink of it and be satisfied in your desire for intimacy, in your desire to know and to be known. This is the Lord's table. Jesus Christ presides here. And Jesus is a real person. Just because he is with us by the power of the Holy Spirit doesn't make him any less real. And we don't need to know the presence and the power of God because people are roaring like lions. We can know the power and the presence of God because he is ordained to come to us in the ordinary means of grace through word, through sacrament. But it's not any less powerful and real. And so if you want to know Christ Jesus and you want to enter into his fellowship and commune with him today, I want to invite you to bow your heads and your hearts and to prepare yourself to meet with Christ. And if you have a personal relationship with him, you are invited to come. As you bow your heads and your hearts, I'll invite our servers to join with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word. The word that was made flesh long ago as Jesus came in the flesh to live and to die, to rise. Came long ago in order to establish a relationship, a a renewed and right relationship with your people, O oh God. We thank you for the word that is made flesh anew as it is fleshed out through the embodied preaching of the word of God. Lord, we hear you. and We hear your promise that you are going to prepare a place for us in order that we might be with you in order that we might be in continued and eternal relationship with you. We thank you, Lord, for the word that has made sign through this sacramental meal that has made real to us through bread and through cup. And as we come into your presence here at the table, Lord, satisfy our desire to be in right relationship with you, to be in intimate relationship with you. And nourish us, Lord, as we wait and as we long for that day where we will see you not only with the eyes of faith, but we will see you in the flesh. And we will know you as we are known. So Lord, take these elements, these bread, this cup, set them apart from their natural use. And may they be used supernaturally to feed your people. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. This morning we will come by rows. You're invited to come each by row. If you are unable to come, if there are some physical uh, limitations, please tell your neighbor to inform our elders. They will inform our elders and then they will come and serve you in the pew. But until then and in that moment, uh, we continue to worship the Lord. Now all has been made ready and so I invite you to come.
Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks. You've loved us so much. You came and gave your life. You conquered sin and death. And you declared that victory on the cross boldly and loudly for all the world to see as you rose from the dead. And in this Eastertide season, we give you thanks that we can enter into the fullness of the life that you have for us, the abundant Christian life. It's characterized by faith and hope and love, peace and union with you. Thank you, Lord, that we can know you truly and intimately. We can know you now and we will know you for all eternity. We thank you, Lord, that you have come into regular contact with us, and that we can feel your presence among us even now. And help us, Lord, having been filled with you by word and sacrament, having been filled by you through the power of the Holy Spirit, filled up in order that we might contain in our lives the glory of God. Send us out with your blessing in order that we might live lives of thankfulness and gratitude for all that you have done. In order that we might go out from this place and invite others to come in and to come into a personal and real relationship with you, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> To come in and to know you by your word. To come in and to experience you practically as the body of Christ worships each and every Lord's day. We thank you, Lord, for this glorious mission which you have bestowed upon us to be the church, to be the church gathered and the church scattered in order that through the lives of your people, the manifold glory of God may be known and declared. We give you thanks for all these things. And we pray them all in Jesus' name as your people and all God's people said, amen. <clears throat> I'd like to invite you to stand with me as we declare our faith together in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what is it that we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is the final two verses of Round the Throne in Radiant Glory.
And so now go out into the world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no man evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all men and women. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you. Today, tomorrow, until Jesus comes again. And then indeed it shall be forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. You are dismissed to linger longer. Go outside and have a donut. Woohoo! Says all the kids. There is nothing greater than the people of God joining together for worship on the Lord's Day. We're so very glad that you have been with us this morning on our live stream. We started our live stream ministry a number of years ago to serve those who could not be with us in residential worship. Here at Beverly Heights Church, we place a high value on worship. We believe that God has called us to gather by his love for us each and every Lord's Day. If you are close to us here in the greater Pittsburgh region, I want to personally welcome you and invite you to come and join with us in residential worship if you find yourself able. For those of you who may be joining us this morning who are not in the greater Pittsburgh region, I wanna encourage you to consider finding a local church where you can worship on the Lord's Day. You could even consider going to the EPC's website where they have a church locator to help you find a local church home. God bless.